In roller derby, holding space is an empowering, often intimidating act of strength and strategy for oneself and or teammates. Holding Space, the podcast, clears the floor for conversations that touch upon race, class, identity, and privilege to amplify stories, build community, and make more connections in the skate world. Expect lots of smart, dope skate people musing about life on and off eight wheels and silliness. Can't forget the silliness that you never knew you needed and won't be able to live without. This is Holding Space with Magical Wheelism. Welcome. Hey, what's up, y'all? So as you do your groceries and your errands and clean your house, I thought that I'd bless your feed with this 2019 recap, courtesy of Purple Reina of Tucson Roller Derby and yours truly. We had a really great time talking about the last 12 months and then some and I can't wait for y'all to hear it and tell me what you think I hope um, you've had an awesome and momentous year and stay tuned for the second part to this which is a 2020 questions which Reina and I also answered and you know had a really fruitful discussion okay gotta go that bad bad television isn't going to binge itself peace so my name is rel or purple reina is my derby name i live in tucson arizona and right now i'm playing for tucson roller derby i've played with tucson roller derby since 2017 that was when i first started with like the new skater program and yeah, so I've been skating with them since then. What typical positions do you play? What teams are you on? I am on a home team, which is called FTW. And I'm also on our charter team right now. Technically, the, the roster hasn't come out, but we're I'm training with the charter team right now. And I was on the charter team team last year and that's the Tucson Saddle Tramps. I am primarily a blocker. I think when I started out I just assumed I wanted to jam and was going to jam and then started blocking and realized I love blocking. So <laughs> I, I would like to jam this season though. I'm hoping to do some work at least for my home team. Sweet. Oh and I didn't ask you oh, do yeah. you do any other type of skating or any other sort of hobbies? Yeah, I so I always intend to do more bowl skating. I had started doing bowl skating like right around the same time that I started doing derby, but it seemed like derby always took up so much time. And every time I was like, oh, I'm going to set aside an hour to go to a skate park. It didn't work out as well, but I'm still intending to do that. I got a little bit better with it this year, like in the spring. But then once it hit summer here, it was so hot and all of my momentum kind of disappeared. <laughs> is that what happens? Is it like what like when is your season in, in Tucson? Is, does the weather so, impact it? Yeah, the weather, we tend to take a summer break. And I'm not sure if that's like a normal thing for most leads. But for us, it's mainly because of the heat. Our primary uh, practice space is outdoors. So the second it hits 100 degree temperatures, we that's like our limit. We cannot skate if it's 100 degrees. And a lot of times, even at 7 p.m., it'll still be 100 degrees. <laughs> mm. Yeah. And that's also... Um, we call it the monsoon season. So that's when we get all the summer rains. So half the time, summer practices get rained out or canceled anyway. We know each other primarily through social media, which is kind of yeah. fascinating. I know. And <laughs> There's so I really, many people I only know through social media right now. It's so strange. Isn't that something? <laughs> yeah. And Twitter was one of those things that I never really, I was always just kind of like a Twitter lurker. I would go on there occasionally to read stuff pre roller derby but once I found out about derby twitter it was like I actually had a reason to be on there and something that I cared about to stay up with but anyhow yeah, definitely we're in like the final stretch of the year of the decade and I 
I'm want to just personally be really introspective, mainly like around this time of year, but also around my birthday, which is in August. And yeah. kind of, you know, I like to take inventory. I'm a Virgo, so I looked at my Google Drive folder of goals and intentions <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> from years a lot <laughs> from years past. <laughs> I was kind of trying to wrap my head around the way to have this for the podcast, you know, and yeah. figure out a way to doing a monologue for like 40 minutes. <laughs> so exactly. I was like, there's got to be other folks around the Twitter sphere who are just as into like thinking back and looking forward and, you know, that sort of thing and thinking about intentions. And lo and behold, Purple yes. Reina <laughs> raises her hands, shoots me a line, and and here we are. And I really appreciate that. Thank you so yeah. much. No, thank you. I know. I was surprised that there weren't a bunch of other people chiming in. And I was like, oh, okay. It's like I'm the first person. <laughs> it was like an experiment for me because I'm also trying to widen how I, I guess, how I crowdsource this or how I, you know, how yeah. I find people to talk to an interview and not to listen branch out and trout yeah exactly mm-hmm. and see what i catch but again like yeah. thank you okay so i wanted to kick this off by looking back at 2019 did you happen to have a little time to brainstorm what the years looked like for you yeah i started to i've got a few things written down kind of like things that were kind of like themes for the year and are they mostly Mm -hmm. personal like derby league specific or derby community derby world specific or skating world most of them are kind of wider community and then i have a few that are more specific league-wide stuff that i was thinking about with my own league that's awesome Mm -hmm. Okay. I have about 10 different things, I believe. I wrote them down in a couple different places, but some of them really like overlap. So really it's probably more like five or six big themes. Ditto. I came up, I'm looking at my list and I have 14. (laughs) And I wonder if we overlap in any. Uh, Oh yeah, probably. That'll be interesting to... Mm -hmm check but they were mostly like headlines and things that caught my eye although I like I have them numbered I don't want any weight to be put to them like in terms of their yeah. number it was just to keep track of how many there are uh, and most of them are definitely like more skate worldwide and derby wide rather than personal but I can yeah. definitely incorporate in a couple I definitely did anyway do you want to share yours first how about we we go back and forth? Oh, okay, that that's good. I like that. Cool. All right. Okay. So, do you want to do us the honor? Oh, have me start. Okay. Yes. One of my 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 top one that I think it wasn't just this year. It was this group of skaters started doing this previously, but I just Team Indigenous has been huge to me, and I feel like just the momentum that they have kept going over the past couple of years, and kind of like the movement that they're building, is continuing to have more and more of an impact on Derby. Sweet. Mm-hmm. Team Indigenous was also on my list. Also made my list along with Jewish Roller Derby and the We Are Nation exhibition game at Champs because of just how groundbreaking it was and uh, how how powerful it was to see a team see teams that are are trying to decolonize roller derby and tried to expand the notion of what a team and what a nation is defined as in roller derby and in society at large and I think we're starting to see fruits of that of their effort and their work even in just the fact that they kind of successfully lobbied to change the World Cup eligibility for nations and teams. You yeah. know that. I think that uh, initially Jewish Roller Derby applied and they were turned down on the spot. And so oh. at the end of this year, we saw that amplified. So they're definitely yeah. having an impact and I can't wait to see what they what they what the next year brings. But I'm really thankful and you know appreciative of all the work that Tigs and Jumpy and all of them have done for Roller Derby. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Dope. Okay, so I will go next. And mm-hmm. 2019 for me 
was the rise of representation and yes. um, BIPOC who skate or BIPOC who skate and Queer Skate Alliance, for example, I feel were instrumental in raising visibility and representation issues on Instagram and social media. And they were the catalysts for fundraisers, for merch lines, rollouts, call outs, call ins, and other pages, other pages for underrepresented communities in skating have also cropped up, I think, because of the work yeah. that they've brought up this year. And that's rad. Neon, Olive, y'all are awesome. Definitely. Yeah, I had both of them on my list as well for pretty much the same reasons. Just, um, yeah, being able to bring more attention to things that I think a lot of us have been talking about at least since I've started Derby and that now seeing those conversations becoming wider finally, and not just like these small niche conversations that you're just having on the side and you're kind of afraid to bring up with others. I think they, they helped people find themselves and create a community for, for underrepresented folks, but they also served an, a dually important purpose and, and, and role in showing the dominant communities that we are here and that we are skating and there's so much talent and we have so much to say too. So I oh, really yeah. appreciate that as well. Let's see. So kind of on the same note of representation, um, another team that I had on my list was Dos Por Cuatro because for me, I know that personally it meant a lot to see like the first Latin American team in champs it meant a lot to me to see a almost an entire team of skaters that, that visually i could look at and think these are skaters that look like me um but also just like their whole story like their whole thing is this big underdog story which is great and i think a lot of people see it as very um it's that kind of story that people like to see, but to me, it also just brings attention to those issues of privilege in Derby and how privileged some leagues are over other leagues. Well said. I also had yeah. Cuatro <laughs> on my yeah. list, and but I had it under an umbrella called Argentina Capital and Pride of Derby in Latin America. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because yep. I also <laughs> wanted to extend the shine to Sailor City, who also. So, oh, yes, that's um, right, because they did amazing. Yeah, they they oh. snagged the Continental Cup East and VIP yeah. that, in that tournament. Yeah. And like you said, they made the case for Derby in the Global South by their gameplay, but also by raising awareness, like Pop-Up's article on the Apex about how yeah. challenging it is for people in developing economies. So, yeah. yeah. To that yes. end, I also have <laughs> Latino America Resiste. I want to shout out Chile and yes. Puerto Rico and Colombia and Ecuador and Bolivia and all of the countries that the people just stood up and rose against their, you know, state violence and corruption and inequality this year. In the Derby world, Metropolitan Roller Derby and Las Cabras Roller Derby were instrumental in, in amplifying what was going on, what was taking place in their streets when the media wasn't doing it. They were awesome and they definitely lived up to Derby's revolutionary moniker this year. Absolutely. Oh, okay. So a big thing that wasn't, I mean... It, <sighs> It's not necessarily a positive, but it's it was something that finally got brought to light on a larger scale. It's just the issues of um, racism and racial bias in officiating in roller derby, and particularly after um, the piece that Queen wrote. And that, to me, was like it really hit home because we had already been dealing with it in our league um, with particular skaters already noticing this for years, probably the whole time that they've been skating. And it was, and, and I think it still is going to be a huge, it's one of the things that people are still trying to push back again against and act as though, well, okay, we brought attention to this, you know, six months ago, and now we're just kind of not thinking about it again. And having to keep reminding people like we have to keep this on the forefront it can't just be like oh this was something that was an issue that got brought up six months ago and now we've already moved past it it's like 
no, it's still a huge issue and we have to figure out how to kind of build structures into place in tournaments, um, especially for how to deal with this better as a community. Yes, I agree. I, I think that it's, and I, and I've spoken to people after, after ECDX and in the light of all of this and after, you know, the, the policy changes, the officiating changes that WUFTA enacted and it's still going on and, you know, miscoloring is still happening. And that is really, really unfortunate. And I, I really think that WUFTA needs to take this break and, and I hope that they, they're actively looking at this policy and, and thinking about how to give it more teeth and um, ways to, combat this issue once and for all because it's been going on for years it really has on the bright side at ecdx derby got gritty kitty that is my (laughs) that is my (laughs) highlight of one of my highlights for the year gritty kitty just it's he's the the mascot that we got that maybe we didn't deserve but he made the the, The Derby sphere, the Derby world, the, the Derby verse better for his presence, and we're also grateful for, to Team London and and Coffee and Team Gotham that helped Grady and found him a home in New York. And so, yay, Grady Kitty! <laughs> yes, I loved following that on Twitter. <laughs> it was oh, amazing. <laughs> Let's see. Another highlight for me this year. This is a skater who has just meant a lot to me this year. The Smacktivist. I just feel like this was the Smacktivist year. And I'm also biased because they did come at the beginning of our year last year to help us with our leadership retreat. That was really an essential part of our lead starting to, for the first time, like confront issues around trans inclusion. And the Smacktivists came and led uh, like about an hour and a half workshop and then also did some coaching with us. But just watching them this year as a skater and I just thought they killed it at Champs and I was so excited. That's awesome. (laughs) Yeah. Yay, the Smacktivists. Along the lines of trans inclusion. My heart was warmed to the Derby community's response to that terrible turf article about quote unquote men in roller derby that came out and Mm -hmm. also the trans awareness uh, trans lives matter uh, shirts Mm -hmm. at champs that people will use as their warm up shirts. It always warms my heart to see Derby come together and uh, you know in one strong loud vociferous yell tell the world what we're all about and what we stand for that was really great to witness once again yes more of that please derby in 2018 yeah (laughs) yes like please please (laughs) um my next one is more of like a league specific thing but i think that it can be applied to i feel like i see the, the wider community doing this it's just um basically holding yourself accountable and making active steps to repair things that you've messed up. I feel like that's one of the biggest things that our league has been focusing on and will continue to focus on this year. But I feel like, I mean, and and some of that has already been touched on in earlier things that we talked about on this list, but just, yeah, kind of not, not backing away or shying away or being defensive when you're called out and figuring out ways to actually move forward and create something better from that. Can you give us an example of how your league battled this? Yeah. um, So our league last year, kind of like a large exodus, and it wasn't necessarily just people leaving because they were moving or retiring. I think that a lot of it was definitely related to burnout and people not getting the built-in supports that could have been a part of the league previously. And so I think for me, I was really interested in figuring out, well, rather than, okay, this is, I think people were just seen as like, oh, this is just this one individual's experience. This is this one individual's experience. And coming together and figuring out, well, what is it 
that's actually going wrong. Because if you have this many people leave, there must actually be something going wrong. Like you can't just have like 10, 15 people leave over the course of a year without it. There being some kind of basis for what is wrong and making sure that we were then talking about what are these things that are going wrong that are specifically related to people not feeling heard or not feeling as though they really have a space to be comfortable in roller derby. And I think for a lot of people in the lead, it was different reasons. Like for some of us, it was definitely related to race. For others, it was related to mental health issues. For others, I think it was just the expectations, um, like feeling as though there wasn't enough flexibility and their and expectations of them and figuring out what structures we had in place that were making it bad for other people essentially. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I mean, as a lead, we discussed the issues of race and racism in officiating. And it was because a skater in our league, I mean, multiple skaters in our league had already been bringing it up and then they had to continue bringing it up again. And, and I think because we had been sort of working on building better communication, I think more people were more receptive to actually saying, oh, okay, I'm going to listen to what is going on here rather than immediately be defensive, which I think was definitely the case in prior seasons where I don't think people were going to be receptive at all to hearing that. They would just be like, oh, no, it's just a mistake. Uh, It's just a one-off thing. Like, this is that's not real. No. I mean, and it's a process, right? It's a practice. It's not a, like a one-off. You're not going to be able to pencil in a meeting to eradicate racism in Derby and then be done with it at the end of the night and lock up and go home. <laughs> like, it's just exactly. not, <laughs> you got to keep going. You got to keep practicing at it. It's, it's exactly. hard. So that's, that's good to hear though, that the, y'all have started that process and looking inward. That's really important. Yeah. yeah. Like it's, I think it's, it's getting better and I've seen it get better than it was for sure. 2018 and I'm hoping it'll get better for next year too. That's wonderful. How big is your yeah. league by the way? Um right now I I was just looking at the list and trying to figure out exactly how many active members we have. We are around like 60-ish active skaters right now, I believe. It it might be more because we just had a group of new skaters finish their uh, minimum skills. So we might be up to like 70 now. Nice. Another highlight of the year for me was fat girls skating or fat people skating. I shouldn't say girls. I should just say fat skating had a moment. I feel like with folks like fat girl has moxie, who mm-hmm. became uh, Moxie Roller Skate's first sponsored skater. And k you know, being so visible yeah. and so mm-hmm. body positive. Uh, folks are just recognizing and being very vocal and very proud and making clear through their efforts and through their just existing and kicking ass that fat people can skate too. They're fat skaters. Skater skater bodies are all sizes, not just, you know, the typical like crossfit yes, type yes. person. I know of a a skater in Australia named Sasha Fierce, uh, Sasha Rose in real life, who mm-hmm. is a fat activist and a health at every size fitness coach who has a very active Instagram about health at every size and how it intersects with fat phobia and uh, skating and derby and just is doing that work. And that's awesome to see and witness. Another thing that I want to see more of in 2020. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I have. Uh, fat girl has Matsi on my list as well because I yeah I started following her Instagram last year and yeah I think yeah, just overall body positivity I think that was just one of the other thing, highlights that I wrote derby wide we could still do better as far as representation and who we're celebrating and who we're making more visible but that's why I think it's really great that the non-derby communities have made I mean I really think that a lot of the non-derby communities are the ones that have been doing so much of the extra work with representation 
And I think maybe it's because it is these communities that are more fluid and loose and don't have to adhere to any certain set of rules or ways of being that have been set in place, which I think is really exciting. Yeah. To piggyback on that, just the skaters who have called in the brands, right? And called yes, out the brands. Yes. Like yeah, CIB, I have that on my list. Moxie, mm-hmm. Impala for and they've taken them to task for lack of diversity, questionable compensation practices and or shoddy products. Like it's really cool to see these skaters just find their voices and, and, you know, and not feel tethered or, or silenced by anything and, you know, just coming out and demanding what they want to see in their brands and in their, in the products that they consume. I think that's awesome. Yes. Yes. I believe that sometimes like a year is so long that I can't remember, but I believe that this was at the beginning of the year was when, um, United States came out. Am I correct? Was that the beginning of this year? <laughs> it was, yeah, yeah. It had or like was a, it the end of last year? It Both, actually. It yeah. had a limited theatrical release at the tail end of 2018, but it yeah. premiered on HBO in February of this year. That's so. what I thought, yeah. I think, so that was when most people, I think, had the opportunity to watch it. And for me, that was huge because I just feel like I think so many people are just still not aware of how lot like the history of roller skating and the importance of rink skating in our sports and how, you know, there's these skaters who have been doing this for, for years and years. I mean, I grew up going to roller rinks and watching jam skaters and just thinking like, Oh my God, this is the coolest sub like culture that I've never known, you know? And so I think that for so many people to kind of, for the first time be finding out about this, like that there's this long, long history of black skaters in this country. Like it's like, it it was surprising to me that that so many people didn't know about this, but I'm so glad that now more and more people are becoming aware of the um, history. No, I agree. I think Mm -hmm. that that's one of, that's what the movie does so well is bring that backstory and bring that history to light. I also had a rink in my, in the Bronx growing up and that was the place to be if you were under 18 and couldn't get into a club, you know? Yeah, right. (laughs) It (laughs) It was the you know, pinnacle of socializing for us for teens. And I'm sure we're not alone in that. And so I knew it that way. And I knew of like its role in the early days of hip hop, which I, which United Skates gets into as well. But, Mm -hmm. but just like the, the the regional dance styles, the, the civil rights, the pre-civil rights stories, like that was all rad to see. And the gentrification aspect to it, the racism, that whole like wheels debacle. It was, it brings so much into it. It's so well-made and definitely, I didn't mention United Skates on my list, but I, I, I probably should have. I, I had an item called the nascent revival of roller rink skating. And yeah. mm-hmm. I think that United Skates is a, was maybe a catalyst to that. Uh, but I'm also reminded of Moonlight Roller Lounge. Yes, yes, yes. I was just thinking about that. And Adrian Cooper, a uh, young woman of color, young mother who is in Chattanooga, Tennessee, trying to open up a roller lounge for her community. And also this uh, event that happened in D.C. in November called Capital Skate Fest, which because of United Skates, the I believe it's the mayor of D.C. wanted to hold a skate fest since there aren't any existing roller rinks in in DC at this time and help organize it with the local skate community there. And so I'm seeing little glimmers of hope that are have made me really excited for for what'll come of roller rink skating in 2020. Yes, definitely. This is one that I am actually going to credit you for oh. <laughs> making me think about more in and some of your Twitter postings was about essentially like the role that things like gentrification and development 
urban development have on roller derby leagues and just how many people seem to be losing spaces or are constantly battling with finding space and just figuring out like how can leads continue to be sustainable with the rising costs of real estate? Because mm-hmm. no, <laughs> I know sure. our league has wanted to have our own dedicated space for so long and all of the financial stuff behind that. Like there's so many reasons why we would not be able to do it. Even in a town that seems relatively affordable, like Tucson, rental space is out of control. So <laughs> And no, it's a pervasive issue. I mean, even if you, I don't know if you saw Maki from Sailor City, the official from Sailor City, she like a few days after champs, they tried to hold a tournament and they were like, they were like basically flooded out. So, you know, everyone, oh, like yeah. all the way from the bottom, like all the way from like Buenos Aires to like Rat City, right? Who had that in a PR article. Yes. Everyone is struggling with these issues of real estate costs and, and property values and gentrification. And it's something that Roller Derby really needs to kind of enter into the fray and, you know, become more proactive about, hopefully. Uh, yeah. So I'm glad you mentioned it. Yeah, uh, the Rat City thing was wild because we had actually just got to skate we skated one of the last games in that space we were able we basically did like a scrimmage with rad city where they just destroyed us but it was a really fun experience and when we got to see the space we were like oh god this is amazing and then they told us like oh this is actually one of our last games here because we're losing it oh my god (laughs) it was awful yeah. Well, not to be all like shameless promo y, but <laughs> I launched this podcast. Yes. <laughs> like, that's definitely a highlight of my year. <laughs> It's the first time that I've ever had an idea bubbling in my head and have seen it completely 100% through to fruition. And probably I could, Mm -hmm. if I I think harder, I could think of other things, but this is definitely something that I feel like in the past I would have maybe tried to mention it to folks and maybe get a bite and have someone work on it with me and then it proceeds to fall apart or something (laughs) or people lose interest or, you know, and it die on the vine, but I've kind of just kept at it and I'm really proud of myself for it. And I'm really glad that people are enjoying it and listening. Yes. I am so glad too. Yay. Thank you. (laughs) So that's, that. how about you? How's, how's your list coming along? Um, I'm pretty much just about done. My only other one was like my one personal highlight. Yeah, go for it. Oh, Um, perfect. Yeah. So my one personal highlight would be, (laughs) I think that for other people, this might not, (laughs) this would be something that would be kind of stress inducing. But for me, I got elected to be the vice president of our league, which like was huge for me because while even though I technically ran unopposed because nobody ever wants to be in certain positions and leadership, it meant a lot to me that someone even nominated me because I have frequently never been able to be in any sort of position for leadership. I'm usually never thought about it, never had a work position where I've been in leadership. Um, So for me, it just meant a lot that someone actually saw me as being a leader and then the rest of the lead decided to vote me in as a leader, especially because I feel like I have so many ideas for where I would like to see our lead move. And now I feel like I finally have like a space in order to try to get some of that done. Yay. Congratulations. That's awesome, Reina. You never hear about people being excited to assume leadership. So that's really, that's a fresh, that's a fresh breath (laughs) air. Yeah, I know. Breath of fresh air. (laughs) I know most people are like, oh God, Mm. I have to do this. I don't want to do it. It's so much work. No. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Congrats. I can't wait to hear more about what you, what you cook up. Okay. So I just wanted to give one little quick honorable mention because I feel like they, their, their labor, their work should really be acknowledged. Um, And that's Mm -hmm. to folks who are working to expand skating and derby through efforts like Derby Without Borders, Free Border Skate, who's trying to bring skating and skate classes to children in refugee towns in Lebanon, and Skate Cuba, who've brought a lot of donations to Cuba for 
children there and adults to be able to skate. And also uh, piggybacking to my first point, I guess, or one of my first points about representation, I just want to also shout out Skate Witch, who was the host and organizer of Roll Call, a BPOC skater weekend in yeah. August in Richmond, Virginia. And aside from that, Skate Witch is constantly doing a lot of like sort of fundraising and awareness raising. She is amazing. And so I think that she definitely typified someone who's holding space for others and trying to bring up those underneath her in the work that she does not only in skating and off quads too definitely so shout out to them all right folks where they have it holding space with magical wheelism is available on apple spotify google play and youtube help the pod grow by subscribing and sharing it with friends rating and reviewing on apple podcasts also helps others find us follow the pod on instagram at holding space with magic pod Intro and outro music is by Sun Searcher. The song is called Latin Rhythm. And the cover photo is by James Corbett of Epic Life Images. Find him at Epic Life Images on Instagram. See you next time. Bye.